Welcome to Scuba Diving Magazine and welcome back to Ask Mark, which is my scuba diving Q&A where I answer all of your scuba diving questions. Uh, if you have any scuba diving questions, by all means pop them down in the comments below and use the Ask Mark hashtag to get featured in an upcoming Q&A. Uh, I think right now I'm about two weeks ahead, so um, it, it can take about two weeks for me to actually get to your answer. Um, but yeah, if you do want me to elaborate on some stuff, because it's quite interesting for other scuba divers as well, if they've never thought about it or something it is just useful for uh, for just general scuba diving knowledge but this week i'm answering questions about blunting dive knives because not so many people like pointy dive knives anymore um the xtx 50 versus the xtx 200 apex second stage uh, what actually happens when we service your dive equipment bolt snaps because of course there's a question on bolt snaps um ap diving tech wing and ear care where you're on long dive trips let's dive straight in with the first question first question comes from leopold bloom and they say i carry an aqualung small squeeze titanium and i love it the only downside is that for some reason the titanium version they don't have a blunt tip option i thought about grinding the tip off but i'm not sure if the knife is massive titanium or steel with a layer of titanium on the outside in which case i'd ruin it by grinding off that layer good or bad idea yeah the the titanium version of the uh, of the squeeze both the do they call it a big squeeze and a small squeeze they're both spear points um it's not the pointiest of pointy but it is still kind of pointy um is it titanium coated no it's just a single piece of titanium as far as i'm aware um it's uh, is beta titanium we tend to get alpha and beta titanium on um, on scuba dive knives um they're, they're titanium alloys but they're more like corrosion resistance so they're better for marine environments um but i only know of one like cutting tool that is titanium coated and i don't think they actually do it anymore i, I remember them stopping doing it it was a uh, I want to say a dive right cutting like the trauma shears they used to have this like golden finish to them and uh, and they used to like sort of sell it as titanium but it was actually titanium coated stainless steel um so yeah no you should be fine i mean remember that it is a very one-way street if you are um, grinding it off but no it, it shouldn't be um titanium coated it should be titanium all the way through so you should be pretty safe to do that um if not let let me know um as, as far as i can tell and as far as i've ever known it's always been a single piece of titanium they, they do it for the for the argonaut um and the, why wouldn't they do it for the um, for the squeeze so no i think you're pretty safe with that one Cordy O'Neill says, hi Mark, big fan, been following you for uh, for years from Simply Scuba, thank you. Um, I'm looking to build a long hose setup and currently use XTX 50s and a DST. Is it worth upgrading to the XTX 200 and purchasing a five port DST and passing my 50s down to my newly qualified partner? So no, really, the, um, the, the only difference between the XTX 50, the 100 and the 200 is cosmetic. Uh, on the 50, this ring around the uh, the front is like a, a rubbery black matte plastic. On the 100, which I don't think they make anymore because it's sat in this weird middle ground, it was like a matte chrome. On the XX200, it's a shiny chrome. But other than that and the little like rubbery sticker on the top, on the inside, it's exactly the same. Uh, the only difference in the XTX range uh, is when you get down to the 40. The 40 doesn't have the breathing adjustment knob. Uh, I actually had one person, they brought their regulators in for a service and they had an XTX 40 Octo, which just has like a, a blanking plug over that. You still have Venturi, but you don't have breathing adjustment. And, um, and, and it had a little note on it saying that, oh, I think I dropped a cylinder on it or something. And the, uh, the breathing adjustment knob broke off on my Octo. If you could fit like a replacement one, uh, it's just like, no, the, the 40 doesn't, never has come with a breathing adjustment knob. So, um, but no, between just the second stage, the XTX 50 and the 200, no, it's just cosmetic. Um, if you really wanted to, you could just get a replacement front cover um, and then that would almost turn it into a 200 except on the paperwork. Um, 
The, the main upgrade is going to be in the, the first stage, that FSR, but with that five port DST, the swivel turret, uh, that's what I use. I just find them much more practical than the, um, than the FSR, but no, there's no real difference between the 50 and the, uh, the 200 as far as second stages. Philip Lucky says, question, when service, uh, when service is done on your BCD or regulator first and second stages, etc., what do they actually do when these services occur? As I've always been interested, thank you. Um, yeah, so, so you walk into your dive center. Uh, that's usually the first thing that happens. Um, so you'll, you, you hand your, your regulators and your BCD or whatever it is over. And the first thing that would happen is usually we put some kind of identifying ticket on it. At the dive center I used to work at, we had the, um, uh, the tickets with a ticket stub on the end. They had a corresponding uh, like four or five digit like alphanumeric code on it so that you knew that these regulators were this customers and, uh, and you couldn't collect them. That way you, you wouldn't give them away to the wrong person. Um, so they are immediately identified um, so they don't get lost in the system. Um, and then yeah, you, you sort of say what needs to be done to them uh, or what you would like them to, um, uh, to do to your regulators to service them or whatever. Then well, we, we used to put them in a bag just so that they kept it all like together. We usually recommend removing any um, octoclips and little identifying things that can fall off or get like lost. Uh, some divers they put little like tokens and things on their regulators so that it's it's a bit more personalized uh, but they can get lost because we just disassemble it completely and yeah it's not in our programming to go oh yeah remember that little stuffed animal toy that they had on this particular hose no they, they tend to either get lost in the box or just fall off and just roll away so try and remove them beforehand um, but yeah behind the scenes First thing that happens is like a, a visual. We'll have a look over your regulator and your BCD. What we're mainly looking for is general wear and tear and like visible like scratches and damage. And we'll make a note of that because of course it's happened where you hand someone's regulator back and they go, oh, it's got this scratch on it. No, it, that was there when it came in. I don't believe you, you've done it. You owe me a new set of regulators. So we do this visual like once over. Uh, if there is any like obvious damage, we usually photograph it. Uh, we'd like some kind of timestamp so that we can prove, yeah, this is what it looked like when it arrived. Um, but also any, yeah, general wear and tear and slight obvious damage. We had a set of regulators and they're, they're metal bodies and you could tell that it was like slightly bent. And as soon as the, uh, the technician disassembled it, it went ping. So of course it needed a new body and all that kind of stuff. So we usually mark that down and uh, photograph it just so that it covers our butts basically. Um, and then, yeah, then we just disassemble it. Uh, I'm actually weirdly coincidentally uh, disassembling a, uh, an old second stage. Um, and yeah, you basically disassemble it all the way. Um, and then on each of the like component parts, there are certain O-rings and seals that get replaced. There's a, a service kit for each and every regulator. And in that it has replacement O-rings. So we go through everything and we're taking off all of these little O-rings and, uh, and sealing surfaces because oh, if I can get it to focus on that and not my face, go on. It's not going to do it. There you go. Uh, you might be able to see it's just bedding in ever so slightly on that uh, on that ceiling surface. So you pop that out and you dispose of those. Everything that can uh, is usually the metal parts goes in an ultrasonic bath. So it's cleaning all of the like the verdigris and the um, like leftover grease and all that kind of stuff. Really just cleaning it uh, because trying to get in all these awkward little nooks and crannies especially on the like inside parts of the barrel and things uh, it's just a real pain so that goes in an ultrasonic bath that like vibrates it all and uh, and sort of gets rid of a lot of the uh, the grime if it's particularly grimy uh, like this one uh, which you might be able to see um, then yeah we usually spends a bit more time and there can be a um, extra cleaning 
cost. Uh, if your regulators are particularly uh, grimy and they take a lot of time, then yeah, there's sometimes a, a surcharge for that. So yeah, they come out of the, uh, the ultrasonic bath. We look over each of the component parts and look for any imperfections and anything that's, um, that needs replacing. And then you basically reassemble it using those fresh O-rings and sealing surface, um, uh, sealing like gaskets and things from the service kit. You reassemble it. You then reattach all the hoses and all that kind of stuff, put it all back together. You then balance it, uh, and and that's basically just tweaking it on the on the inside. That there's all sorts of little adjustments so that we can balance those interstage pressures. And um, depending on the the service center and how much time they have, sometimes they put them on a test bench, which like breathes the uh, the regulator, and um, and yeah, it, it just. Just make sure that they're, they're set up correctly. They then get bundled back up. Um, some dive centers give you a phone call if they have time. Um, and that's basically it. If you, um, if you have time, then the, the best thing to do is to take them for like a, a shallow check dive because regulators do bed in, because it's all like springs and things, uh, they, they kind of ease in and the more they're used, the, the lubrication kind of spreads and the, it gets into like the, the motion of things and, uh, and actually breathing cycles again. And they can need a little bit of a tweak. So don't stray too far from your dive center because then you just like come back and just say, oh, hey, I took them for a dive and now they're just hissing a little bit. Uh, and then they'll just tweak them then and there and then they'll be good for uh, for a fair while. BCD, BCD, it depends on the BCD. Um, some inflators can be serviced, in which case, very similar thing. They'll be disassembled uh, or the inflator will be disassembled. Uh, they'll replace O-rings and then they'll reassemble them. They don't need to be balanced because they're normally a bit more um, basic and mundane than a, uh, than a second stage and a first stage. Um, they'll clean the inside and the outside usually with some kind of um, antibacterial, antifungal kind of cleaning agent. Uh, they'll clean all of the, um, uh, the dump valves as well, just to make sure that they're all moving and the sealing surface is still sealing effectively. Um, and that's about it. Some inflators, the um, Reliant inflator from Oceanic was just a swap. So um, if, if it came in, you took the old one off and then you'd fit a replacement one. Um, that, that was it. It's, um, you, you couldn't disassemble it and, uh, and service it. But a lot of inflators nowadays, you can disassemble and get service kits for them. Um, but that's, that's basically it. Yeah, we, we pull them apart. We take all the old O-rings out. We re-grease them if they need greasing, reassemble and uh, rebalance. Cags51 says, for bolt snaps, should you go with mating marine grade or can you buy a decent stainless steel one and prep them for scuba? Uh, so can you use basic bolt snaps for scuba diving? Yeah, but only like once or twice. Um, the, the scuba ones, they are specifically made with, um, oh, mine are all hanging up. Uh, they're specifically made with marine grade steel. Um, so, you can see on this uh, little bolt shackle that it's where it's like patina. You get that patina effect. Uh, it, it's not marine grade. It starts to um, just sort of rust. And the usual way that we prevent things from rusting, like on dive knives, is you you coat them in like some kind of hydrophobic thing, like silicone gel or like a, a Vaseline, something that prevents the water from actually getting to that like stainless steel service. Unfortunately, with bolt snaps, because you're handling them a lot, you're just wiping it off. So the, the salt water is still going to get to it and it's going to get on the inside, around the piston, around that uh, that little spring on the inside. So yeah, nah, they're, they're just going to get knackered before long. So best thing that you can do is kind of coat them with a bit of um, like olive oil on the inside of that like piston where, where the actual trigger moves into that'll help but ideally it's the kind of buy cheap buy twice you're um, you're going to end up getting a, a proper scuba diving bolt snap before long um yeah it's, it's not really worth it it's it's worth investing in a proper bolt snap instead of trying to use uh, some cheap ones 
Ed Dudley asks, hi Mark, any thoughts on the AP Diving Tech Wing? Uh, yeah, I've never used one myself, full um, disclosure. I've seen one, um, definitely going through, uh, through the dive center as a British dive uh, diver, you, you tend to see a lot of AP diving stuff. But the Tech Wing, so the Tech Wing is a wing style BCD, uh, it's quick adjust. Uh, it has a uh, party favor in it, in that you can fit single cylinders as well as twin cylinders. Um, but not manifolded twin cylinders. They have to be independent cylinders. And you get this um, like Bebo kit, which is just two Kanbans in like a figure of eight. So you strap them both to your back. It's very quick and easy. Um, yeah, yeah, tough material. AP Diving, they, they do make some nice dive equipment and it is tough as well. Um, I think it's a pretty I mean, it's not a light, light weight BCD. It's more for diving at home and you could kind of travel with it abroad, but it's still gonna take up a fair amount of your, your baggage allowance. But yeah, tough wing style BCD for singles and moving into twin cylinders, uh, but yeah, independent, non-manifolded. So you're gonna to have to do some switching at some stage. Um, but yeah, yeah, well put together. They, they are a good solid diving brand. Craig Miles says, loving the Q&A, what's the best way to look after your ears on a liverboard or dive holiday when you're going to be diving three plus dives a day in a warm climate? So the first thing is, uh, so there's two ways that your ears can hurt. It's either through like barotrauma from equalizing or not equalizing and something called otitis externa which is like a, uh, an ear infection in your, uh, your ear canal. Those are the two most common like ear pains that you get. Um, I think most people know about equalizing, so I'm gonna skip over that and focus more on the otitis externa because it's basically swimmer's ear. Um, and what, what causes it is because you're in and out of the water just constantly, as you say, three or four dives a day in a warm, humid environment as well, that water gets into your ear and it can cause like the, the skin cells in your ear just to swell up, like how your fingers go funny after a long bath or when you're diving. Uh, the, similar things happens to the skin cells in your ear and they can just kind of swell up a bit. They create these little crevices between the skin cells and the natural like bacteria and stuff inside of your ears, as well as some that are floating around in the water can get into those crevices and they multiply and that just causes, um, uh, what you call it? Oh. The, the skin to just swell and uh, and it gets uncomfortable by that point it's kind of too late the the first thing is is that leading up to your dive trip the, the, a good like two weeks beforehand don't use cotton earbuds uh, like everyone doctors e ent doctors and all that kind of stuff always do not put anything in your ear, especially cotton wool buds, because that can make like small scratches um, and that can make it even worse because then the bacteria can get into those scratches and just cause inflammation. So don't poke anything into your ears. Um, the, your natural ear wax is hydrophobic. So that stops, it creates this slight layer of, uh, of wax on the inside of your ear canal to prevent water from actually getting to the skin cells and causing them to swell. So try not to um, yeah, poke anything into your ears. I've known some divers use um, olive oil, just like a drop of olive oil. And that helps to, again, like coat the inside of your ears before a dive to stop the water from getting to the actual skin. There are, of course, um, like ear sprays and things that do something very similar. If you look up swimmers' ears, um, because yeah, swimmers have the similar problem, you'll, you'll find um, two things. There's, there's either the preventative, like before the dive care, and then you also get the post-dive, after-dive or after-swim care. So either something that you put in your ear first to help prevent the water from getting to the skin. And then after the dive, something that you put into your ear that helps to dry it out and kill some nasties. The important thing is, is that if you've gotten to the stage where you're starting to get some discomfort in your ears, don't use these treatments. Uh, it's worth seeking medical care, talking to a doctor, uh, because they'll prescribe something that's properly aimed at these 
bacteria uh, and it's not going to make it worse or turn it into something different so it's more about prevention as opposed to um, cure if that's the right word um, by the time it gets to the like the cure phase then you're talking to actual medical professionals who can uh, prescribe something proper so it doesn't go uh, so nasty. But yeah, pre-care, so you're not scratching the inside of your ear. You can use some like s treatments that are specifically made for swimmer's ear to help prevent the water from getting to it. And then after the dive, you can put some, um, some it basically helps to dry out the ear, but don't put cotton wool in to dry it. I've heard, um, you can use like a, um, a hair dryer, but try not to like blast it into your ear too much. Obviously, you basically want to towel dry it. Just kind of pull on your earlobe to uh, to get any water out after the dive to uh, to let them dry out as naturally as possible. Uh, but just avoid poking things because that can one remove that wax layer. It can also scratch and uh, and just make a really make it really easy for bacteria to get in. Um, but yeah, have a look at swimmer's ear or uh, otitis externa um, and uh, sort of preventative measures for that. And, uh, and that should make your life a bit more comfortable on your next liverboard. And that's it for another week. Um, yeah, otitis externa, definitely worth uh, looking that up or swimmer's ear is much easier to type and spell. Um, I used to get it on my first couple of liverboards. You, you think that you haven't been equalizing early and often when you're on like the plane backwards and you're like, oh, a bit of discomfort in your ear. It would, um, you know, when you start to go deaf in like one ear, it, it makes that weird kind of feeling noise. Uh, yeah, that's kind of it, or the uh, the onset of it. And and it really is just drying out your ears in between dives so that it's not so like wet and, uh, and killing those nasties. But if you've got any interesting questions, uh, scuba diving questions, pop them down in the comments below. And if you want to get featured in an upcoming show, use the Ask Mark hashtag. Uh, remember to like, share, subscribe, do all that good social media stuff. Uh, head over to the website and, uh, and check out our magazine, the new magazine has just released uh, as recording I just remembered that I'm like two weeks ahead so yeah it's, it's been out for a couple of weeks now um, yeah check out all our social media platforms thank you for watching everybody and of course safe diving <laughs>